Lövsta är ett av flera gamla järnbruk i Uppland där man smidde järn redan på 1500-talet. Men de gamla byggnaderna och masugnarna är rivna. Men det har legat slagghögar med giftigt innehåll lite här och var. Här går och bruksort är bevarade och idag går ett hundratal personer på orten. Och på en yta av cirka 20 fotbollsplaner gömmer sig flera tusen kilo arsenik enligt Länsstyrelsens beräkning. Ja, arsenik är naturligtvis ett oerhört farligt gift. Men hur ligger det idag? Är det bundet på något sätt? Är det risk att det kommer ut i grundvatten? Det är den typen av frågor som jag tycker är intressanta. Har man kan... svar på det? Inte idag. Det Inte idag. Idag finns inga svar. Men... Risken är ju uppenbar i själva fallet. Men det finns brunnar i området som förorenats av arseniken. Och mätningar kring just badplatsen visar halter av cancerframkallande kolväten över gränsvärden. Och arsenik i så höga halter att det finns risk för akut förgiftning. Utredarna har rekommenderat att man ska sanera och gräva ut badplatsen. Redan 2007 hittade man höga halter arsenik vid badet. Men den ansvariga kommunledningen kände inte till provresultaten innan SVT kom. Ja, då behöver man rimligtvis göra någonting åt det också. Och där är det har inte gjort statliga medel. Men det har ni inte sökt heller i det fallet? I det fallet har vi inte sökt statliga medel, än så länge i alla fall. Det finns nära tusen platser i Sverige som fått högsta riskklass för gifter som kan skada människor och natur. 86 av dem ligger i vattenskyddsområden. Och på 51 av de här platserna har man hittat föroreningar i grundvattnet. I bara tre fall har man tagit vattenprover som är rena. Resten, där befarar man föroreningar, men har inte hunnit kolla. Som här i Ed, här finns en hundra år en plantskola där man använder det extremt giftiga bekämpningsmedlet, DDT. Så det användes det DDT en gång? Det var så. Ja, det är, alltså, använder alla plantskolor. Ja. Även det här området är vattentäckt och 2007 skrevs en rapport om mycket stor risk för spridning till grundvattnet. Var du själv ute och spruta? Ja, det hände. Men enligt Länsstyrelsens databas har man inte ens börjat en förstudie av fallet. Nej, det är omöjligt att hinna jobba med alla de här objekten på en och samma gång. Och även om man bara kokar ner till vattenskyddsområden, högsta riskklass, även där går det långsamt alltså. Ja, nej, vi har inte resurser för att jobba med alla de objekten. Mm. Och så Uppsala stadspark då. Där fanns också plantskola som troligen använt det till. Exponering kan ske genom hudkontakt, jordintag i munnen eller inandning av damm, säger utredningen. Men man säger inget till barnen som leker och kryper på marken. Stadsparken är i Uppsala så står det. Kanske det är det det. Mm. Ja, det var ett objekt som inventerades förra året. Finns det det där? Ja, det vet vi inte. Det är inte undersökt. Och Tärnsjö, också det vattenskyddsområde. 60 ton kromavfall från gamla garveriet finns i den lilla Tärnsjö. De närboende tycks veta att man knappast tar ett dopp i den här sjön, men det finns ju turister. Här ska man säga varning gift i sjö. Varning läbb i barnplats. <skratt> Lite skylt. Ja, det är en ganska svår fråga att svara på, men när det finns risk för akuta effekter då, då kan det finnas vits med att till exempel sätta upp en skylt. Mm. Men har ni satt upp några skyltar det sista året? Eh, nej, det har vi inte gjort.
We put it together and we put it out on our website as an interactive database for people to access. And where they can sort of look up the sites that they were. Uh, if are you am I living close to a site with contaminated places? And there were information from the database about the different places. So in one way that was a public service to the public about the places. But I don't think that data journalism is about just giving data to the public. It's also about interpreting and uh, doing journalism about this. So together with this big database that we have, we also started to gather other information. And one of the information that we gathered was the water protected sites. Uh, and those we just made, a, uh, made two layers in a map program and found out now, by, by now, it would be really sort of. Oh. It's the best thing ever. Okay. This is the database. Yay. This is the database that we did. And uh, this is the database that we, that the, this is the data that we got. And this is the places that we plotted. This is the information about the different, this is a glass factory. Uh, and these are the maps of the protected water. So just by overlaying the two maps, we could then find the 86 places that we then could go on further to, to look at. And I think that what, that's one part of data journalism. I think that almost every journalist have done some story one time or another about a contaminated place close by, uh, the risks of people for people to live there. But what we did was that we took the 80,000 places that they had in the database, and we said, instead of just picking one or doing the one that somebody calls, called us about, we actually picked the 86 places that were, in our opinion, one of the, that was our angle, which were in or very close by a water protected site. So by doing that, we can then, by, do, by doing that selection, we could then go on to do normal journalistic things, ask for reports, ask for experts, talk to experts, talk to the locals, that sort of thing. Talk to the, if there were, people who still were working in these factories and that sort of thing. So I mean, it helped us start our story. And I think that most people, when they think about data journalism, they think of the happy little men that are jumping around different screens or you know, interactive bar charts and that amazing stuff. Uh, but for me, data journalism is about dry, letting the data drive the story forward, doing the analysis in the, in the beginning of the story. But the good thing about also getting everything is that there's not just one story. There is not just one story from a person who calls me on the phone and says there's a contaminated place close to where I live. This is our, this is just some of all the stories we did out of this database that our local stations did and that the national television did. So therefore, actually if you talk about it in economical terms, you get a lot more stories, you get a lot more airtime for the invested time than you would get if you just did that one story. Uh, so for me, data journalism is two things. It's the analysis, gathering data, cleaning data, analyzing data, finding stories in data, and then it's the visualizations, uh, which I think you've heard, which Linda works on uh, with me at The Guardian. Uh, but for me, the analysis is the thing that I work on. And in the olden days, we used to call this for computer-assisted reporting, which I love because it's so horrible that you just have to love it. Uh, but it's also really good. It's really good because it helps me drive a point. We never talk about telephone-assisted journalism or pen and paper-assisted journalism. Uh, and I don't think we should talk about computer-assisted journalism. Every journalist should know how to use the computer to make him or her a better journalist. Uh, it's a method to reach the goal. I am, as you 
have all seen. Not a very technical person. Uh, but for me, I learned the tools I need to learn in order to make my journalism better. It's a method to reach the goal. And we're going to talk about a lot about numbers. A lot of people think that data journalism is about numbers and statistics. For me, it's about the details. I had a very high boss in, in the Swedish journalistic community that many years, a couple of years ago, stood up and said, when we had a discussion about the WikiLeaks Iraq database that had 391,000 records. And he said, we should never do this kind of journalism because which re there's no reporter in the world that can access this kind of material. And I said, well, I can. Because what you do is this. You, you start by, this was the first query I ran when I about five years ago, got access to the Iraq database. Give me all the documents that contain something about Sweden. And suddenly I'm looking at 57 documents. And everybody, including TV journalists, can read 57 documents. And out of those 57 documents, we did a lot of stories. We did stories about how there were Swedish weapons used in Iraq and how they were used, and actually how they didn't work so well, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> which was kind of fun. But we also did this, which is my favorite story out of, out of the WikiLeaks. We did a lot of stories about torture and all, and like everybody did, including the Guardian. But this is my favorite story. This is the 28,628th row in the database. And it's about a guy who gets caught in a checkpoint outside Baghdad. And he gets thrown in Yale. For, because he has a suspicious, he looks suspicious in some way. And his name was in the database, and we could find him. He had, he had an Iranian by background, but he had a Swedish passport, and he was a Swedish citizen. So we could find him in the motor shop, in the auto shop that he works in Gothenburg, do an interview with him, talk to him about his experiences, and tell the story behind and tell the story behind the documents and behind the WikiLeaks database. Other things that, we, that I would call data journalism is getting data. So this is a, an old story, but I kind of like showing it anyway. This is the EU Parliament's uh, database of, uh, it's not a database, it's documents. It's PDF documents that shows how the parliamentarians voted that day. So it looks like this, and, and now is the time for you all to laugh. This is the Perl program I write, wrote <laughs> to analyze this. Thank you. It works. That's what I'm going to say about my programming skills. It works. So that pulled it all down to a database, and we could do a lot of stories out of this. We could do stories about how the Swedes who always think, that's another sort of trait we have, that we are really, really good at atten attendance. That we could actually show that the Swedish parliamentarians wasn't as good as attendance. I think they were, and uh, there were some of them that were good, there were some of them that were less good. And some of them were actually, we were actually, I think, worse than Spain and Italy, which we would never agree to. <laughs> another thing is when the authorities decide that you can't have the data in the, in the way that uh, you're supposed to have it. This is the Board of Education in Sweden. They produce their data in this way, one sheet of data for each county or each region. There's 290 regions in Sweden. And when I called them up to say, could you give me the database of this? They said, we've chosen to produce it in this way. And I said, yeah, I understand that you've chosen Brazil, but I would like the database behind. No, we've chosen, and you know, it went on like that for a while. And then I went home, I made a little Excel file of all the URLs, I put them into another pro program. And I got the table, and then we chose to produce it in that way in our website. Uh, I am going to, I think, I think that I'm, let's see, he's not here. How much time do I have? Well, I'm going to pull on something else. I have no idea. How's she doing? <laughs> okay. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going.
Okay, I'm going to tell you another example where we use something that you might think is very easy, but when I tell this to journalists, they go, you know, very impressed. This is a way for me to try to track lobbyists in Sweden. And what I did was that I called up the parliament and I said, could you give me the um, sign-in log? You know, whenever you visit somebody, you have to sign in. So I'd like to have the sign-in log for this. So I did actually, for once, I did a formal request. And I said, could I please have a week? Because that is also something that it's a little journalistic trick. You ask for a small amount first. One, they don't get intimidated by you, so that it's easier that you get it. And two, you can also actually check if you're you know, on the right, right track. So I asked for a week. I got a week in Excel. Very nice. Thank you very much. And then they started to thinking, OK, Swedish television database editor is asking for the sign-in log. That might not be a good thing. So they did actually. And I'm realizing that this actually disproves the point that I'm getting to, but I'm going to run with this example anyway. So they decided to clean out the database every night. They decided that I have to ask for the information every time I wanted it, which would be daily. And they decided that they could no longer give it to me in electronic format. So for a year, I sent them one email a day. And they, sent, and they posted papers back to me. And they looked, but they were, they were, after talking to them a little bit, they were quite easy to scan. So I scanned them into a database, started looking for lobbyists, found out that there were not that many lobbying firms in there. So then I went to the lobbying, data, the lobbying websites there. And the good thing about lobbyist firms in Sweden is that they like to brag about their people. So this is the wonderful people who once upon a time, I would say, worked at Trimedia PR firm. So I extracted all the names for the 10 biggest lobby firms in Sweden, put them into one table in access, noting how advanced I am. And I had all the visitors in another table. I joined them together, and I got some hits. And of course, by doing this, I will not catch lobbyists whose names are Stefan Johansson or Maria Karlsson or, you know, common Swedish names. But Emily, who we're looking at here, she has a very unusual name. She's actually the only one who has that name. And how do I know that? Because transparency in Sweden allows me to check every single citizen. So I know that there's only one person with that name. And we could then do a story that was about a little bit about how lobbyists are influenced politicians in this country. So I have kind of two points. And one point is when I got to this country in, U in October and started talking about data journalism, I quite soon realized that people thought I was talking about numbers, statistical reports, or other reports that somebody had aggregated. And yes, that is data. It's very boring data, I think, but it's data. But for me, and I think for most Swedish journalists, data journalism is about original, raw data to do original journalism out of, uh, not to repeat the statistics that somebody else already has found. And I think it has to do with this. Uh, to the left, we see the Swedish Freedom of Information Act, the Freedom of Press Act that was created so long ago that it was actually created in Finland. And it's still Swedish, because it was when Finland and Sweden was one, two countries. So it's a Finn who actually did this. Uh, 1766, it's the oldest Freedom of Information Act in the world. This is the UK one. It came into action in 2005. And I think that the air of transparency that I think that you guys have been talking about all day <coughs> Actually, when you started talking about transparency in 1766, it goes through the whole society in some way. It goes also through authorities uh, and people who work in authorities. So that if I want to have access to data in the UK, if I, if I get it, it's a very formalized pro 
process. I have to cite the law. I have to wait for 20 days for them to give me the answer. I have to talk to a FOI officer at the authority. In Sweden, I call them up. If I'm lucky, I even get to talk to the technician who, who works with the database and can talk to him and say, oh, by the way, could you send me a copy of this over email? Or could you <clears throat> extract, could you run this query for me? Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, and the problem is that there is with uh, Freedom of Information Act of 1766 is, of course, that there is nothing about electronic ac access in that. Uh, so UK has one thing in their FOI, which is that you, are, you can demand to get it electronically. The UK also publishes its data once it's released it to someone, which means that there are actually a lot of data sets out there. There are not many journalists that use them. So this is sort of my overdue, and I'm sorry about that, talk about data journalism and a little about transparency.